Okay, we'll we'll get started. Um, hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I'm Mar Gonzalez Palacios. I'm the Associate Director for Special Collections at Yale University. And I would like to start by respectfully acknowledging the land that I occupy as the ancestral lands of the Quinnipiac, the Pigasset, and the Algonquian speaking peoples. Um, the drawing that you're seeing was uh, the work of Ange uh, Angelica Gallegos, who graduated with a master in architecture um, in 2021. She um, graciously has let me use this map. It is also available at the School of Architecture Tribal Land Acknowledgement page. Um, so the this is an interpretive map uh, that presents the interconnectedness, interconnected boundaries of tribal land over time and the relationship to the New Haven area. Area, the orthogonal lines coming from the west, north, and east connect the center of New Haven's nine square grid and indicate the historical Quinnipiac travel routes that link the Quinnipiac with the Pegossets, Wangong, and Matapasek, Hamanasset, and Niantic peoples. The topography lines above the nine square grid represent Hobomok Mountain, now known as Sleeping Giant. Hobomok Mountain is a landmark and significant place within the Quinnipiac origin stories and connected uh, with surrounding New Haven topography history. Um, just a little bit about the exhibition that, that this panel um, is based on. So Miko McGinty and I first conceived this exhibition in 2019 as part of the Yale's commemoration of uh, the 50th anniversary of co-education at Yale College and the 150th anniversary of women students at the university. Um, <clears throat> our idea got delayed because of the pandemic. Um, and it was also meant to, which did run concurrently with the um, exhibition on the basis of on the basis of art at the art gallery uh, at Yale. So the exhibition uh, pairs uh, work by women who graduated from the graphic design program at the school at the Yale School of Art. So it pairs their thesis work uh, with a with a another work that they produce afterwards. The the thesis works uh, the thesis books are um, one of the uh, collections that has the highest use in special in our special collections, and it's a uh, a really important uh, um, terminal work for, for the graphic design program. They, um, each student interprets uh, the, the prompt differently, but it's meant to uh, bring together the, their experience and their work here. Um, so these, this panel, uh, this is a third of our panels. Um, and uh, uh, what is a graphic designer? In this, in this occasion, uh, our moderator will be Betty Wang, uh, who's a MFA graphic design candidate uh, graduating this year in 2022. And she will be talking to uh, Lloydie Marguanga, uh, who got a BA in 2010 and her MFA in 2015, uh, and is an independent graphic designer. And to Mika Maginti, my co-conspirator for, for this exhibition, uh, who has a BA uh, from 93 and an MFA from um, 1998, and is a principal of Mika Maginti uh, Incorporated. So with that, I, I will leave the floor um, and we'll get started. Thank you. Thank you, Mar. Um, I'm so excited to be here with both of you in conversation tonight. Um, 
um, yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Um, something that I've been thinking about a lot is how the practices that we're cultivating inside school now translate to the kind of postgraduate outside world. Um, and I think a lot of our ideas of what being a graphic designer is in school is so tied to how the program kind of allows you know, intensely kind of personal and research oriented practices and projects. Um, and I'm wondering how your ideas of being a graphic designer have changed or evolved since um, you've been in school. Thanks, Betty, and thank you, Mar, and thank you, Hillary, so much for, for doing this, this Zoom with us and for the exhibition. And um, so, Betty, I think I thought I would maybe answer this question about through the exhibition itself, actually, since we just saw some pictures of it and Mars talking about it. So we we started pulling the thesis books from women from like all the generations of, of graphic design at Yale. Um, and then Mar had the idea that we should pair the thesis books with something that was made later by the same woman, by the same designer. And I, you know, I, I like didn't anticipate this at all, but actually in an, as an answer to your question, I could really see the relationships between the thesis book and later work. Like it was so obvious. And I actually don't think that was super clear to us at all when we were in the program that like how you would draw upon things you did um, in while you were in school. So I have some examples. Um, so Kim Maley, she had a, a, a thesis called Identity Crisis. It was a big fat red book with like pictures of everything she ever like had in her apartment. And um, her first job after grad school was at M and Company. And this is the book she made for Tibor Coleman. It's called Chairman. And it's like a chock full of pictures of chairs essentially. But this is really, her thesis book, um, but with other content. So I always, I thought of that one. Um, Alicia Chang, who did our first Zoom, she made this beautiful, like absolutely beautiful maps of how people in her program moved around the studio, like where they sat and where they walked to. And then when we pulled her a book for her, or it's, it didn't have to be a book, it could be a project. We pulled out um, Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth which she had designed and management her firm had designed. And of course it's all these like gorgeous charts and it ties very directly to the work she was doing as a student. But now with like new content, climate change and Al Gore and, you know, and it was a huge best-selling book. So again, like I could see it there. And then I also was thinking about like from the very early women graphic designers, um, Cremelda Pontes, who did a thesis about calligraphy, like the most traditional looking photographs of calligraphy. But later when we like looked at further into her career, we found that she had used her calligraphy to design a logo that is still the logo of the Smithsonian Institution today. So it's sort of like that directly comes from her calligraphic work. Um, and then in the more recent graduates, we were looking at Wei Yi Li, who's thesis book, you can see the forms that she, now she's an artist and she makes sculpture and sculptural institute installations. And you can see the forms like reappearing. Um, and for me, my thesis was on the subject of longing, the emotion of longing. Like that's what I like wanted to figure out. Like how as a designer I could elicit or examine this emotion. Um, and I did it through photography and writing that was that I did because that's what I had to work with. But when I look at my whole career of making books with artists, I can see I'm using text and photography and I'm trying to create in our audience some sort of like emotion and connection to the book and like an understanding of an artist's practice. So it's like super, it's still, I'm still remaking my thesis like every day of my, of my career. So, and that, that's my, that's my thinking, Lady. <laughs> Yeah, um, I like how you ended with how you're 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 constantly even now rethinking or redoing or revisiting your your thesis because um, I feel pretty similarly. Um, developing a personal practice uh, at school might seem very navel gazy and like uh, self absorbed and stuff, but it's a creative well from which you you know that comes from a very authentic place that comes from your own mental patterns, your own interests, your identity even, um, and 
that's a lot that's a much more expansive space that you could take to whatever you decide to pursue as a graphic designer um it's a sort of like a sense of creative self that you can then take to whatever corporate or independent practice that you have going on out in the economy. <laughs> um, for me, uh, I really appreciated that time at school to develop that personal practice. Um, it was particularly difficult for me, though, because many of my preoccupations and interests were very surface level, I think, or I, they weren't surface level. They were very rich topics. They were just, the way I was executing them led to really sort of unresolved, unfinished, pro a lot of unfinished projects. Um, and it took me a while to figure out how to translate those into something that could be expressed through graphic design. Uh, so for me, things had to get very abstract <laughs> before I could bring back in um, the things that I was particularly interested in. Um, in my thesis book, uh, do I have, yeah, I have a copy here. Uh, looks like this, comes in a nice plastic sleeve. Um, and starting with the form, um, I made the decision that I wanted to do something that was a bit more than a traditional codex, for example. Um, so I had ended up being a kind of concertina slash accordion form that sort of stretched out to forever. Um, and the way I set it up, I was using sort of motifs and graphics and elements from the different unresolved maybe projects I was working on and sort of reconstituting them into this long extended piece as being kind of a statement on <laughs> this journey I was going on trying to figure myself out. Um, and those abstract ideas came from uh, my interest in the form and production of textiles. Um, I'm, uh, I'm a Black person. I'm a Kenyan person. Um, I immigrated to the United States when I was eight, I think. Um, I didn't become a U.S. citizen until, I think, uh, a year after I graduated from under, from um, the MFA, um, just in time to vote for, <laughs> for um, Obama the second time, I think. <laughs> yeah, the second time. Um, and all those experiences, so yeah, so I mean, so those are the things I was interested in, textiles, being particularly African or having some, mm. uh, some inter uh, having a lot of personal investment and interest in the experience of the African diaspora. So trying to get all of that and try to like boil it into <laughs> like a single graphic design element, just like it's, it's sort of an impossible task and maybe something that I, I revisit every now and again as a way of self-expression, not necessarily as something that I could market to a client as being, you know, um, useful, but, or marketable really. Um, but in developing that personal practice, like those were the things that I was interested in. Um, so using things like mud cloth, kente, Dutch wax prints, uh, motifs like the botte or the paisley, um, the same thing, just called different things in different parts of the world at different periods in history. Um, so all those sort of reading and learning about all those elements that I was interested in and then abstracting them or at least boiling it down to something that was more of a universal concept and then revisiting them in graphic design um, was how I ended up um, with this particular thesis book and something that I think I try to bring to um, other projects I have. Mm. Um, as graphic designers, we are kind of problem solvers. So a lot of times, instead of necessarily accepting a set form or a set uh, brief, you might need to boil it down into something, into the component parts, into something more abstract so that you can have more leeway creatively uh, to make something good. Um, and that's, oh yeah. And then in terms of personal project, I feel like every designer I know has like a personal project or a side project. So you go, you do your day job, whatever it is. Um, and then you come home and then like somehow you find the energy to like um, work on like a, uh, sorry, I'm trying to think of some examples. Like I know a friend that does like watercolor cards. Um, somebody else has gotten into like making tarot illustrations as like a, like a side project. And those are all just creative graphic designy things that they do in their own time as a form of self-expression. And I wouldn't be surprised just as Miko and Mar found out by revisiting people's theses, like those are mental patterns. Those are things you're like authentically interested in. They'll come back, they'll come out somehow <laughs> in whatever work you end up doing. 
Um, sorry, I saw a question in the chat about a traditional codex. Oh, and Mar has answered it. So yeah, <laughs> that's my answer. <laughs> that is so encouraging to hear that there's still a way to kind of like really integrate and rethink and revisit all the things that you you both have done in school and it's still kind of like a living um, part of your practice. Um, I think something that you had said earlier about um, the kind of navel gazy aspect of maybe personal work and then also, um, you know, the work not necessarily being marketable or like client driven, it reminds me of um, a kind of kind of perennial question of like, who is the audience that you have in mind when doing personal projects and how different is that when you're doing client work and there is kind of a more concrete idea of an audience and I'm wondering how you both, um, you know, keep in mind a real or imagined audience, how that impacts how you approach work, um, how that influences what kind of work you even take on and kind of the nuances of, you know, you know, client audience relationships, client designer relationships, all of that, um, all those different things regarding, you know, who you make work for and then how that influences what you do. Yeah. Um, yeah, that is a very perennial question. <laughs> um, so I guess in per, I'll start with personal work. I, I kind of would maybe disagree a little bit with the idea that your audience is yourself. Um, it as soon as you make something that comes into the world, like other people are going to see it, and you're either and you're so you're expressing something. Um, I.e., you want somebody else to see, and they might not interpret it the way you would hope necessarily, but that's kind of the fun or the challenge, <laughs> depending on how you look at it, of being a a visual creative person um and in terms of yeah and in terms of pro personal projects like i don't i don't particularly think of a specific audience until the thing is real you know at that point maybe you might be and not necessarily in like mark like trying to sell it to someone or trying to sell it to a client or pitch it to someone just in terms of like showing it to somebody could be your friends could be other designers um that's your audience maybe you know and they could just say something as simple as like that is amazing that's cool that looks awesome you're bringing beauty into the world right um or you know <laughs> questioning things about the world that aren't fair um uh, whatever it is you do um but in terms of um my professional experience for example um i was going to use the example that was in the show um, a book project um, for a show called Defacement, uh, The Death of Michael Stewart. I was a, the, the painting itself is um, a piece by Jean-Michel Basquiat, and the piece depicts the killing of uh, Michael Stewart by the NYC Transit Police. Um, it's not his like biggest, most famous, um, painting. Um, and it's not the one that people typically point out and be like, oh yeah, that's a Basquiat. Um, it's more of a deep cut, I guess, would be the colloquial way to say it. And But what it expresses and what it covers is very, um, is very important and also particularly potent um, regarding the, for example, regarding topics like what it's like to be a Black uh, man, specifically in America, um, what it's like to live under um, situation with police brutality, things like that. Um, and Basquiat, this was a piece in which Basquiat is sort of, and in his other work, um, a, a moment in time where he's thinking about, you know, his his position in the world as a black man, and here's another black man who was um, um, killed in, in such a way. Um, the audience for that book and that show, um, you know, we're talking about, oh, it was for the, for the Guggenheim Museum. Um, and you know, when you think about an institution as storied as the Guggenheim, there's a particular kind of audience um, that you imagine goes to the gallery every season or every other week to sort of, you know, encapsulate culture. Um, but there are also people who might come without, And but this particular painting and this particular story, the death of Michael Stewart, is not something that is generally taught or generally familiar. To people. So there was on the one hand a need to educate maybe a mostly white, wealthy, and older demographic, but there was also a need to just educate anybody that came to the museum about what happened and how artists uh, at that time in New York um, reacted uh, to the incident. Um, and, and to that end, one of the when I first got the um, 
the first sort of uh, rough copy for some of the critical essays that were going into the book. I reacted, I had a really visceral reaction to some of the um, introductions, um, in particular, um, the one of the main curators started their es their essay with a, a benediction, <laughs> like a sort of a poetic text that, um, you know, really spoke to this element of like community grief when it comes to the death of black people at the hands of the police, um, the grief within their family, but also within the black community, for example. Um, and I decided like, okay, like maybe this is a book where the text itself needs to be front and center. So all our um, like section dividers were quotes from um, the, the critical texts, um, sort of typeset in a very bold and um, in a bold and in your face kind of way. Again, thinking about the audience, maybe not reading too much into the underlying social commentary that's going in there. And it's in a way it's just sometimes just put it on a sign and you know hold it up in the street kind of feeling. Um, so that was my creative reflex there. Um, and one other sort of creative decision that came from thinking about the audience was um, we, we were going to, it was gonna be a paperback book and it had uh, extended flaps for the covers just to give it a bit more, um, a, a bit more of a support and structure. So um, for those who are not familiar, the cover comes out pretty long and then it folds back in. Um, and you can actually, once you open the front cover, you can unfold um, that folded in section to sort of have an extended uh, back area in the inside cover. And on those inside covers and the front, um, we printed a photo of Basquiat's painting, The Death of Michael Stewart, i.e. defacement, um, hanging in, uh, hanging in, uh, ooh. Keith Herring. Keith. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know why I suddenly <laughs> forgot his name. I wanted to say Warhol, that's not mm. accurate. It was in Keith Herring's room, um, bedroom, hanging above his bed in a very ornate frame. Um, and then in the back cover, we uh, printed a photo of its origins. Um, so actually uh, Basquiat had painted that painting um, on the wall of, um, Herring's studio and Herring had actually cut it out of the wall and put it in this ornate golden frame and hung it above his bed. But the photo at the back sort of shows this empty black hole where he sort of chopped out the, the drywall from whence the painting had come. And I mean, that element was again, thinking about the audience, like this is a story of this particular painting. It's a through line for an event that was sort of like a thematic through line for Basquiat's later work. Um, or more generally his body of work, but also for other artists whom he interacted with regularly, like um, Herring and Warhol, um, things like that. These were things that were happening in the New York community uh, that affected all these artists. So having sort of that, those um, end, end, um, end frames uh, was, was a nice touch to have um, as a bit of storytelling in the book form. I, I love the book uh, and the design and, you know, I think, um, it was so exciting for me to to see your work lady in it and to have gotten to know you like after yeah. after your thesis project and sort of but then to have this like this book which is really like your design and interpretation and your thinking and all the things you're thinking about the audience who's going to learn from the book um i like it's a great project and everyone should definitely look at this and and get this book um we were thinking a little bit when, like before while we were talking um about you know about art and the art world and you know this is also the field i am designing in and i think having a like we share a deep sense that art and artists and the conceptual practice and the artistic visual practice are all like super important to our culture and so really worthy of our efforts of as designers to like help get that out there mm -hmm. um and, but to address people who don't do art books, um, like I think about design as the, as the combination of the designer with the content, like you are the designer, you have your skills and your understanding, your analytical skills, and then you have hopefully real affinity with the content you're working with. It doesn't happen in every project. It doesn't happen in the same way, but um, that sort of affinity with your content is like super helpful to look for in your design career. You know, something like what Lloydie's talking about where she feels really passionate about what she's designing. 
Um, and I was thinking a little bit about like reflecting about our, my, my career and in the question in terms of like the audience and like who needs to see art books and like what are the art books out there and I've only pretty much designed art books, you know, or museum graphics and stuff. So I was thinking a little bit about getting to design a lot of books about underrepresented artists. So like women artists who've worked for many years, sort of unrecognized, but yet still have a really incredible studio practice and are super deserving of a big monographic book. So I was thinking about Joan Jonas, who's 86 years old. Um, she's made work like steadily since the 60s. She's taught at MIT. She was super influential there. But her best friends like Richard Serra and Klaus Oldenburg have like dozens and dozens of books. And when I met her to do her Venice Biennale book, you know, she had had one monograph. She had all the copies in the basement of MIT. She like, she said it barely got sold. She would give them away to the students every year to whoever wanted them. So she was like not, you know, but yet she's, you know, known today as a super influential artist who, um, I think whose work is is like a criti was critical, but it really wasn't until she was about 80 that we were able to, not just my book, but her monographic book went out there to sort of help tell her story. Um, I also was thinking a little bit about Ruth Asawa, the Japanese American sculptor who's now, like whose work I see regularly in museums. But when we worked with Ruth, um, she had no representation and all of the work was still in her house in San Francisco, it was like hanging in the in the like upper area of the living room and in all the corners of the rooms. And um, and my Japanese American family knew her through from my from Berkeley, and they had actually all been interned at the same internment camp, Rower in Arkansas during World War II. Um, so we sort of had this other connection to to Ruth. And I was going to mention here, it's kind of depressing, but. This weekend was the 80th anniversary of Executive Order 9066 that Roosevelt signed sending Japanese Americans into prison camps in 1942. Um, Ruth's story is super interesting about how she goes to Black Mountain. She goes to Teachers College to get out of the um, rower and then she goes to Black Mountain and she becomes a really important educator and artist. But at that point we made the book, she, her work was not widely known. Um, outside of San Francisco. Um, and so I wrote a little list here. So with my, with my team here, Rita Jules and Rebecca Silvers and Julia Ma and Eleanor Morgan, um, we were thinking about monographs of women who waited their whole careers for their first book. Um, so it's really kind of very powerful. We have Meryl Latterman Euclid, um, Martha Rossler who had books in Europe, but not here. Alice Mackler, um, Mary Kors, um, then also just like working with women um, on books that were like sort of mid, mid late career, but sort of big moments of Teresita Fernandez, Rita Banerjee, Kiki Smith, Louise, Neville, uh, Louise Nelson, who was deceased, um, Lauren Simpson, um, feminist, a feminist book for Marilyn Minter, one of my like great honors and working even with Yoko Ono, um, when we made her book, she was really just known as um, the woman who broke up the Beatles and very under, under recognized as an artist, um, despite her important role in um, Fluxus. Um, so I think, you know, I think, and today, right now, we're working on a book about the Chicago sculptor Richard Hunt. He's African American, he's, in, he's 86 years old. He had a show at MoMA in his 20s. He's had an incredible career. So little of his work has even been photographed, let alone published. Um, so we're doing a big book about him. And again, my hope is that like when we're done, the audience, the people who see this book will feel like this book has always been there. His work has always been there. He's been making work nonstop and he's had like an absolutely fascinating like career. Um, but I think, you know, when you look online for him, it was pretty hard to find things when we started this project. Um, so I think that, that's sort of my, my thinking on this.
Yeah, it sounds like in both of your practices, um, especially professionally, there's such an emphasis on kind of highlighting, um, you know, narratives and experiences that have been overlooked. And it's about visibility, communication, kind of education of the public. Um, and I feel like because of our own identities as women of color, like this kind of responsibility to this education is so kind of crucial to the way we see graphic design and our role as graphic designers. Um, and I'm so curious to hear, you know, your experiences and thoughts about, um, you know, your particular kind of racialized and gendered identity working in graphic design, how that's kind of influenced your, um, you know, work in the industry and, um, yeah, kind of the broad general, um, you know, question about your gendered and racialized experiences. Yeah, so I thought it might be helpful just to jump off with start off with some like stats. Um, don't quote me on this. I'm not a journalist. <laughs> Most of these stats sort of kind of align to my personal experience, but um, they're sort of dribs and drabs that I've picked up from various uh, sources like the IGA, but they're not um, like I'm kind of I might be wrong, but I'm kind of disappointed the IGA doesn't have doesn't dig more into this particular topic when it comes to demographics within like the graphic design community, um, or it's behind a paywall and you know <laughs> it's not that thence it's not Googleable. Um, so yeah, stats. Um, so the graphic design industry has generally been very male dominated, for example. Um, but I was reading some stats where like in 2017, it was 55% male in one survey. And then more recently, it's more even, it's more of an even split. I was seeing more like between 47% male to like 49% male. So women had started to sort of turn the tide a bit. Um, in 1991, it was 91% or 93% white. And apparently there was an article that came out, I forgot who published it, where the headline was, why is the graphic design industry 93% white? Um, and more recently that number has shrunk, which is good, um, uh, but it's still 76, 75, three quarters of graphic designers working in America today are, are white. Um, we're mostly freelancers, apparently. Um, not too many people uh, working uh, in like a corporate structure, whether that's like just a small business or a studio like Nico's um, or working in like in-house agencies. Most of us are freelancers. Um, and I'm kind of okay with that. <laughs> I enjoy being a free agent, um, get my variety, work when I want, that kind of thing. Um, a lot of us are in private industry. That makes sense. Um, marketing loves graphic design. They always need graphic designers. They compensate well, so makes sense. Um, though it'd be interesting, it's always, it's interesting to see um, designers that work outside of the general um, private industry marketing um, world. Uh, and we tend to be based in urban centers. Again, that makes sense. I think that lines up pretty nicely with like other artists who tend to immigrate to New York and LA. Maybe later in life, you'll find a nice big house to put all your sculptures in. But <laughs> when you're young and trying to get by, like, yeah, you're going to go to a big city. Um, I think the most upsetting one though is like 10% of women are in mid-level jobs or higher. So, I mean, there's a lot of graphic design women in the, um, in the industry, but we tend to be apparently, we're not the art directors or creative, um, uh, what do you call it, creative directors and things like that. There are fewer of women in that area. area. Um, one stat that I thought was nice was that we're a pretty wide age range. Um, I feel like graphic design is one of those things you can practice until you can't like click a button anymore, you know, uh, especially with the tools we have now online and um, available to us, the tools that we use now, like, yeah, you can keep, you can keep designing until like you can't see anymore, which is great. <laughs> um, and, it, you know, it's good also uh, as a young designer thinking of like, yeah, there are people, you know, in their 80s still turning out amazing work, you know, um, and it's sort of hopeful to me because I'm like, yeah, I'm going to be one of those, you know, <laughs> I'm going to be around here until people chase me out the door, I guess. Um, so that's good. Um, personal experiences, I've been mostly hired by women. Um, I've worked mostly with women um, wherever I tend to, in corporate life and in terms of like my freelance experience, um, that those are tend to be the people I work with. And for a while, I had this skewed view that mostly women do graphic design. Uh, <laughs> 
but then you sort of, you know, trying to keep your ear to the ground, you, you go to the blogs or the, it's nice that posts and all the people getting like spotlights and features, like, you know, 90% of them are dudes. So it's like, Oh, I just, <laughs> they're just not around me apparently. Um, and I'm often the only uh, black designer, um, both in the corporate world and getting hired for things. Um, no one's, no one's ever said that I'm the first black um, creative designer that they've worked with, but um, what does that mean? Um, on the one hand, it kind of gives me a little bit of freedom in some ways in the sense that like in a corporate um, setting, um, if I come in with like Bantu knots on my head, like no one's gonna tell me any different, you know? <laughs> they can't say I look unprofessional because then it's a whole, it's a whole thing, like you're opening up a can of worms. Um, so I can be like the kooky creative in the corner sort of doing her thing. Um, but on the other hand, you know, there's fewer access to mentorship and, you know, other like community benefits of not being the only blah, blah um, in, a, in a room. Um, in my personal life, though, I've had the benefit of having mentors that are both male and female um, and people of color. Um, so for that, I'm grateful. Um, so in terms of developing a personal practice and a creative community, um, I'm glad that I can email someone like Miko for, you know, advice on how I should price something, you know, um, versus having to ask like my supervisor at whatever corporation about like, <laughs> you know, who might not, <laughs> who might not give me the right information. So um, yeah, uh, I think that encapsulates most of my personal experiences as a professional. So, yeah. I really, I feel that, I mean, the, my career being supported by women and um, <clears throat> so much. And okay, so Betty, when we, we talked about this a little bit before about the, you know, and, and ladies highlighting it too, like who are, who are important graphic designers question, like they're, they're men. And um, so I have like a sort of answer to this that reaches kind of back into my story. Um, which is that, okay, so I'm in high school and I'm a super passionate feminist. And I had read that Emma Goldman's autobiography, which is like, by the way, it's like six volumes. It was a super performative read on my part for reading it. Like, I'm not sure that how much I really understood of it, but I got Ms. Magazine and I was sort of finding about, out about Andrea Dworkin and other feminist um, writers in the, in the early late eighties, early nineties. Um, I got to Yale, I took theory with Sara Suleri, I took um, impressionism with Linda Nochlin, and when I was, I, I got to graphic design through Letterpress, which Lloydy, I think we both have yeah. that entrance. Yeah, life. <laughs> <laughs> I know, totally. Um, and then I did an installation in the GE common room of my dorm called Our Feminism, and um, it was to the prompt say something to somebody. And I was super inspired by the, these women journalist friends that I had, um, Karen Alexander and Alexandra Lang, who's now an architecture critic. And so I was like really deep in feminism, like I, no problem calling myself a feminist. Um, and so Sheila arrived my sophomore year um, and all the famous white men um, who were in charge of the Yale graphic design program prior to that, you know, these were, the people who I'd been told about as the most important graphic designers in the world, um, especially Paul Rand savaged her for being a feminist. And I was totally furious. Like I was so mad about it. I wrote an article in the Yale Daily News about her. And then I was at a party with Paul Rand and one of my other graphic design uh, friends was like, don't you think we should go meet him? And I was like, no, like, why should we go meet him? Like, he doesn't want to talk to me. I'm a feminist. So, you know, sort of thinking about, <laughs> I was thinking about gender and, and graphic design, you know, right from the beginning. Um, this is before grad school, but definitely throughout grad school. And, um, and like Lady, you know, so last year I made a list of all the artists I've worked with and the curators I've worked with. And mm -hmm. I really had to think about, um, you know, who had hired me in, in my career, you know, at this point, it's like tw over 25 years of my career. Um, and I thought about all the times when I was up for like a really big deal book about a, a white male artist and how I like wouldn't get the job and I'd feel kind of bad and feel kind of sad. 
But then like when I look back, I can see who actually gave me the jobs, you know, that they were um, artists of color, that it was uh, Japan society and Asia society, um, that Asian artists have really supported me, like women, women throughout the field, the editors, the head of publishing, you know, like there are women all over the field who have like helped support. And actually like, I'm like, wow, I got to do so much more interesting books as a result of this. I feel super, super lucky. So anyway, I guess that's my sort of answer about demographics. But yeah. yeah, I mean, I relate to so much of um, what you both said as well, especially, you know, I see in school that the demographics with regard to gender are fairly even, you know, but still like when I th even think about um, the graphic designers that pushed me into graphic design, like when I was applying to school, you know, a few years ago, it was like five dudes that kind of shaped my perception of the program. And it's still like, you know, I can name like five guys who have really admirable practices and I can't, you know, I, I wonder what that is. And I know so many talented, you know, women graphic designers and like, what are they, what are they doing? But it's also like, why, you know, do you both kind of like have feelings or thoughts about what, you know, what that disparity is or like what, you know, contributes to it and why it just seems like, you know, there's so many like notable male names and yet, you know, they're equal if not more female graphic designers out there. Yeah, I, I can hop in and say like, uh, there's, I feel like part of the issues in the industry are also part of issues with society more broadly. Um, you know, uh, number one, on the one hand, uh, a male practitioner might, you know, bang their own drum a bit more loudly, might um, get, walk in the door, maybe get more respect or get more runway or leeway to, you know, to be um, insistent on what their practice is and what they do and offer that to you, take it or leave it kind of. Um, whereas I feel like, well, personally, anyway, I've had to do a lot of negotiation, you know, where it's like, and then also maybe, you know, I, <laughs> I've, I, I prefer also to be like appreciated and hired by people I know through a network, you know, um, I'm not necessarily online with a big following, like banging my drum in that way. So I, I feel like this is a really squirrely answer I'm giving, but, <laughs> but, you know, like, I'm not going to diagnose the issue with society and, and women <laughs> in my answer, but in my experience, it, I think it's a combination of factors for sure. I think, um, so, I mean, I think what you're referencing a little bit are like those cultural clues that we get as women, um, you know, about what you're allowed to say and like, you know, how insistent are you allowed to be? And you know, I think that we know there are different roles for men and women and really early in my career, a woman graphic designer I know, Told, told me that if there's a man in the room uh, in a design meeting, everyone tends to look to him for approval, like no matter who he is in the room, and that I should be really aware of that. And of course, thanks to her, I could see it like right from when I was really young and see it and even see it in myself. Like you can't, you really can't let that happen in the, in the room. But of course, it's like nearly impossible to control half the time because the other issue as a woman of color is that we're women of color in a service field. Um, so there are lots of like cues going on that we're the hands for the larger goal or the more important goal or something. And so like in my experience, it's been at least in these really dissonant moments where um, like the cues from the client that I'm just hands or I'm just here to service things, you know, is really in conflict with, with what I think I'm doing, you know, that I think I'm, like bringing all this expertise and knowledge and analysis and you know practice to the room and so actually like my being silenced is really like confusing in a way as well especially as I get older um but it still happens like absolutely still happens mm -hmm. and then um you know let's see I think it, you know and I want to protect my the the designers here from experiencing that ever but of course like I actually can't protect them from it. It happens to all of us. So, so sort of how do we, like, how do I, how do I deal with that? And I have a, like, 
a couple answers that I've been working on, but, you know, I think it's still hard. And one is that, um, you know, now I've been in this for a while. So some of the like curatorial assistants that we worked with in the beginning of my career are now the curators in chief of a museum. Like this is gonna happen to the women you work with, whoever you are, men, women, like anyone, look around. Some of the very young people in the room with you are someday going to be like the boss and like helping women and women of color get there is like a super, like something I feel really strongly about, but also there's just a huge amount of respect that you have after you see this happen enough times. You're like, you don't know who it's gonna be. Um, and so, you know, like have have proper respect. And then um, I guess, Lady, I was sort of thinking about this when you, you were talking before about like sharing what you're making with the people around you. So like continuing throughout your career to show what you're making, whether it's your personal project or your professional project to your friends, to your other women friends, to other people in your community, however you define it, so that you are seen, like you're seen through your work so that that doesn't go away. Because I think that there's also a little sense that maybe women's work isn't worth seeing. There's like a little bit of a cultural norm around there, or even that like client-based work maybe isn't worth seeing because the client's controlling it. Well, it's still the work you're doing as a graphic designer is still worthy. Um, and um, the other big thing I learned from the Alexa Fauna project is that there is not a big enough internet, like women designers do not have enough of an internet presence. Like it's really easy to find the men, it is hard to find the women. And I mean, women with amazing careers, like thank God for the AIGA medal ceremonies because they actually published like half the people in this who have a medal. I like had to go and research them through the medal because actually it's really hard to find their information. So like make the website that you don't feel like you should make and put the work out there and keep track of all your work on a CV or a log book, like Jack Whitten kept a log book. I always think it's so cool, but like keep track of what you made so that you have a record of all like the things you, you have made, whether you put them on the website or not. Um, and all the people you've worked with and all the good and bad, you know, keep track of them because that's actually part of your like work legacy. Um, and so I was talking to Rebecca in my office, Rebecca Silvers, and she said that when she started here, um, she really pushed me to improve the website. And I felt I had struggled always with my website. Like I wasn't worthy, my projects weren't worthy, you know, like who am I and like to brag like that. Like I felt so much like pressure against like tooting my own horn. And she's like, you're literally doing a disservice to the people out there, so women who are looking to see like what the world is out there for graphic design. Like she's looking at imageofthestudio.com or other websites to try and figure out like what is graphic design work and it's all men or, and we're not really present, but it's like some sort of weird, um, and you know, you have to shake it up like for everyone else, like, you know, make your website, keep it up to date, keep your work out there you know so I, I wanted to jump on that also just in relation to um for example women and women of colors especially our relationship to risk taking for example mm -hmm. putting putting your work out there is a risk you're taking you're opening yourself up to all sorts of um I mean, women on the internet is a whole other topic, but <laughs> you're opening yourself up to criticism from people that are you might be judging your work based on like whatever they're coming to the internet with. Um, and this tendency to self-minimize, I feel like as a whole, like it just needs to be weeded out of every woman that's born for the rest of eternity because this self-minimization, again, yeah, it does do the work a disservice. It does other women a disservice. Um, but it's interesting because what you run up against is this like, this reality that boldness and putting yourself out there is not often rewarded the same way, say, um, somebody who wasn't me <laughs> might be rewarded. Um, you know, I've been told that I'm a good cookie 
but I should be bad sometimes. And I'm like, I have no runway to like necessarily, you know, do something really crazy and out there because or, or to insist my way of doing things is the right thing, you know, um, uh, even if I know that's true, even if I'm bringing all my experience and uh, talent to bear on something, um, there's a, you sort of run up against that harsh reality or it's like <laughs> you have to you have to negotiate and in a way you end up minimizing yourself and your work, which is really detrimental um, to your practice. Um, and yeah, it's something I'm, I'm learning <laughs> to, to weed out and also to sort of realize like, it is kind of silly that like you're a graphic designer and you don't have a portfolio online. Like you're sending PDFs, like you're, like you're in the nineties. Well, did the, did the nineties even have PDFs? Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> just, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, so it's, 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 it's something you kind of actively have to fight against. Um, but yeah, so I think Miko, you, you put the nail on the head. Yeah, it definitely seems like the way that we're socialized as women of color, like we are trained from so young to kind of, um, you know, appease and be quieter and kind of just satisfy all the feelings in the room. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems like we're kind of running out of time. Thank you so much for this um, amazing and thoughtful conversation. Um, I think we should move into Q&A. Um, thank you so much. That's been a really interesting and um, a lot of a lot of things to think. And I kept shaking my head. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. That's that's uh, kind of inspiring to uh, to empower ourselves. Um, so I'm going to jump into some of the questions from from the audience. Um, the first one is from Wendy Maldonado D'Amico. Uh, Do you see trends that indicate that the demographics of graphic design industry are changing? And do you see evidence? Uh, what evidence do you see? I think so, 100%. Um, it's just maybe not changing fast enough, I guess, but I'm impatient. <laughs> I want social justice yesterday. Um, <laughs> Because, you know, like, um, I think what Betty pointed out, like looking at the people in the program with her, like it seems pretty evenly split, split between men and women. Um, I went to, I, I also was in the program with um, people of color from all over the world, which is great. Um, so in terms of the pipeline, um, there are people coming up that are super talented. And um, the issue though, moving forward is supporting them, you know? Um, and finding those opportunities um, for them. And I think that's, yeah, that's the struggle, but you know, we're here <laughs> um, and we're not going anywhere necessarily, you know? Um, could be like so many of the artists Miko mentioned, like maybe it's one of those situations where it's like you get to 80, you have this huge body of work and people are like, oh, it's actually pretty cool. <laughs> Maybe somebody should make a book about this. <laughs> but you know, we're here, we've been here. Yeah, yeah. like um, things are changing, just um, not, not, not fast enough. Yeah, I guess like, I love that Lordy, like we're here, we've been here. We really are here. We really have been here making work. And I think, um, you know, in art, I'm, we see this sort of changing focus um, to new, more demographics and the artists are there. They just weren't having the shows and they weren't hung in the museums. And um, so, you know, what happens, what happens for us where we have more of a runway too. And I see it in the internet, you know, there are more, um, more blogs and more articles and there are more places that are about, about women designers. But um, I think we know like that, a lot of design is about putting yourself out there. Um, I think in terms of the future and demographics, teaching, um, I find I finally am teaching now at MIT and I have really interesting and diverse students. And um, my goal is to make sure they feel like really seen and understood and um, encouraged as designers that, that this is a future that includes them. Um, and I think as, as I think that the teachers are so important in, in 
pushing this message and passing it along. And Lloyd, you've you've also taught, I'm sure, and become a mentor to your students. Yeah, I've taught, um, and uh, yeah, the group. It's 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 a great. It's always a great. I, I teach intro courses, or I've taught intro courses, and those are always interesting because it's always kind of a grab bag of people that are just have maybe a passing interest in graphic design, and then either get bit by the bug or totally turned off by it. <laughs> um, but it's you know it's even people necessary you know who didn't even know about graphic design as a discipline. Um, like personally, I went to, when I went to undergrad, um, my idea was to be a general art major um, and I was gonna do painting, I guess. Uh, <laughs> my parents were like, okay, if you're gonna be all creative and artsy, why don't you do architecture? I hear that pays well. Um, and it wasn't until I took my first graphic design course um, where I was like, oh, this, you know, this fits me. I like this a lot more. I enjoy doing this. Um, so, and in terms of like, even my first uh, my first graphic design job was um, with someone who gave me a chance and it was a former professor of mine from undergrad, you know, um, which was, you know, my first time where I was like, yay, you know, I get to do graphic design as my as my job. Um, and since then, you know, I've just been chasing every opportunity and saying yes to everything <laughs> until I get, you know, until hopefully you get to a place where you can now choose your clients and focus on your own personal practice and prioritize that over you know, get in the bag. So, um, yeah. Oh, good. I'm glad you told your your story of coming to design too, because I wanted to hear it. So this actually connects a little bit to, I think it's going to be our last question because we have three minutes left uh, <laughs> from uh, Katie Planting. Uh, do you have any advice for those, those of us in undergrad looking for community in design? There's um there's a couple of um oh god online products I want to say I I'm blanking on like the names of things but I've been to a couple of meetups uh, for creatives um in I, I live in the Arlington Virginia area DC um, and there's been a couple of meetups that are much more casual than say joining like a, a professional guild um, and there's no members too so <laughs> um, yeah so like uh, getting out there and I mean that's one way. Um, of meeting other creative people, but also a lot of folks that I network with, uh, people I've previously worked with, um, whether it's for a paying job or just for some um, something that somebody wanted to do, um, you know, mount a show or um, print some posters for something. Um, yeah, working together and sort of doing random things with other creative people has given me those connections, I think. Yeah, and I think, um... From my experience, I did a lot of jobbing as an undergraduate. I don't know, lady, if you did, I like printed a lot of posters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah we yeah, yeah. <laughs> we printed yeah. invitations and posters. Yeah, and it was a job. And finally, like often the the client was another student, so it wasn't really like a traditional client relationship. You just like made the thing and gave it to them. Um, but that I think like helps helps build the community. I mean, maybe it's like cross you're crossing out of design, but you are the designer, but it will lead you, I think, to other designers as you're making work, especially when you're really young. Um, and also, I feel like if you, if all your friends are graphic designers, that's, that might be more of a problem. <laughs> like, uh, you know, like, it's good to have painter friends and sculptor friends and, you know, I don't know, movie making Theater friends. friends. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and I don't mean just like personal friends, but like, uh, professional contacts in other industries. Um, it's always a good source of um, inspiration as well. Yeah, we get to cross over a lot, graphic yeah. design among yeah. fields. And so I think it's quite nimble that way. So, okay. Well, the hour flew by. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you for our audience and for all the questions. Sorry, we weren't able to get to all of them. Uh, so this is the last of our three panels. We will be posting them on YouTube, um, on the Yale Library YouTube channel um, as soon as we do the transcriptions. Um, I also wanted to let people that have access to Yale buildings that we are ac actually going to extend the exhibition until the end of March. Uh, more details will be posted shortly. So thank you again, and I uh, hope you have a good evening. Thank you, guys.
That was so fun to talk to you all. And thank you, Mar, in every way for this project and working together on the exhibition and getting to talk to all these amazing designers. And so thank you. And I wanted to say thank you for everyone, uh, Miko, Betty, Mar, um, Hillary, for organizing all of this. And thanks for the audience. Um, a couple of familiar names were popping up, I see. And it was great to quote unquote see everyone. <laughs> it's like, hi, friends. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good night. Good night.